Hi, I'm Ya Guangzhang, a PhD candidate from the Old Center at Purdue University. Thank you very much for this opportunity today for us to present our work. Large-scale cellular coverage analyses for UAV data relay via channel modeling. There are three parts in this presentation. We will start with the motivation of the problem and talk about why we think drones may play an important role in future wireless communication, especially for rural areas. Then we will look at some theory behind our research and have a brief introduction for channel modeling. At last, some simulation results on drone-aided data relay for cellular networks will be presented. Also, there will be a Q&A session after each part. We will be more than happy to answer any questions you have then. A little about the background. Traditionally, because of the low population density and the high cost of infrastructure construction, rural areas are of a very low priority in terms of cellular broadband coverage. Here we have some third-party coverage maps for major cellular service providers to illustrate this situation. As we can see, the cellular coverage for rural areas in the U.S. is considerably worse compared to the urban regions. There are just so many unfavorable factors that limit traditional network construction in rural areas. It can be cost prohibitive today to provide all the mobile communication features we expect when users are distributed over a large geographic area. However, the demand for broadband there is increasing dramatically during recent years, with digital agriculture being one of the main contributors. In this case, low speed connection will suffice for applications like soil sensor data collection. But ideally, high-speed broadband is needed for features like real-time video streaming, which will enable fantastic applications like activity recognition and remote farm management. In a nutshell, more often than not, only intermittent connectivity is required here because sensor data collection can be scheduled to be done at given times and key agricultural activities like planting and harvesting need connection for only the involved people and vehicles when and where they are doing the job. These requirements brought our attention to drones. Drones, or unmanned aerial vehicles, are gaining extensive research attention these years. Their flexibility fits the applications we just saw extremely well. Researchers in various networks are talking about on-demand deployment of UAV-aided networks via multi tier architectures, relevant problems like placement optimization and route planning are under investigation. However, on the other side, there are still uncertainties like battery life and safety issues. How do we compare those two sides? Everyone expects the coverage to be better with drones, but how much better? Is it worth the effort to gain that much more performance for a limited time, say one hour, because of the battery life? It is interesting that there are not many papers for this to clear things up, especially for the real-life drone deployment. So in this project, we carry out a series of quantitative analyses for large geographic areas based on real-life data. The key contribution is that we established via simulation quantitative upper bounds on system-level coverage gains. For example, a cellular coverage ratio gain of around 45% can be obtained in Indiana State with data relay UAVs flying at a height of 100 meters, compared to the typical pedestrian 1.5 meter case. Here we define the coverage ratio as the ratio of the area covered to the total area, and the coverage ratio gain is just the difference between the coverage ratio for a new case and that for the baseline case. This reveals how much more area can be covered in terms of percentage. For real systems in Indiana, one should expect a coverage ratio gain at the same level or below. 
Of course, more improvements may be expected for regions with a larger elevation variation. The scenario we considered is demonstrated by this figure. For simplicity, all antennas are assumed to be omnidirectional, and the key is that we assign a dedicated UAV to fly right above each user to provide better cellular coverage by avoiding obstacles. We chose this setting mainly for two considerations. First, this is already possible to implement today and it will be beneficial to many rural agricultural scenarios. Second, given a fixed UAV height, this is close to the best one can achieve at the system level. After all, it is not yet practical to have one dedicated UAV for each user. What we wanted were two kinds of coverage maps, the blockage map and the path loss map. The blockage map is a simple and intuitive way for people to locate blocked areas. It is generated mainly according to the LiDAR data because LiDAR can record obstacles like trees and buildings. The path loss map considers for each location of interest the cell tower with the best connection condition and plus the path loss values accordingly. In our work, path loss values are computed according to the NTIA Yahada model, which has limitations but is one of the standard go-to models from the regulator's point of view. In short, the Yahada model takes signal reflection and refraction into consideration and estimates the path loss according to a variety of information including the terrain profile and the obstacle clutter type. Any questions so far? Now, before moving on to the simulation setup, let's have a brief look at channel modeling and path loss. As already introduced by Young's talk, Link budget is an important process for us to gain knowledge on a communication link in terms of signal power. In order to get more general equipment irrelevant results, we have focused on the wireless signal transmission stage between the transmitter and the receiver. Our signal goes through a channel and suffers some deterioration accordingly, and path loss is one of the most important parameters because it indicates how much signal power will be lost over the air. It's worth noting that, like many parameters shown in Young's talk, path losses are also normally represented in dB. Here we just want to share a quick trick on how to interpret dB values. dB is actually short for decibel, which is a tenth of a bell, thus decibel. You may have heard about this before, for example, in terms of sound volume, because it is a very common scientific way of representing proportion values with really large ranges. In these cases, instead of dealing with the numbers directly, we're more interested in their magnitude, or roughly speaking, the numbers of zeros in the values. We have some examples in this table. The baseline case, 1, has no zeros, so it's 0 bell and 0 dB. Then 10 has one zero in it, so it's 1 bell, which equals to 10 dB. And similarly, 1000 is 3 bell and 30 dB, while 1 million is 6 bell and 60 dB. Got it? Now, path loss is just the proportion of the transmitted signal power over the received signal power in dB. For instance, it is not uncommon to see a path loss of around 100 dB in cellular communication. 100 dB is 10 bell, so the ratio is 1 followed by 10 zeros, which means the received signal is just a tiny, tiny portion of the transmitted signal. Channel modeling gives us a way to estimate channel conditions like path loss based on the wireless environment that we have. In our work, as mentioned before, we are interested in two things. First, how helpful are UAVs in preventing blockage? For this, we will look at a very simple model, the direct line of sight model, as an example. 
and then introduced the criterion we used 60% clearance in the first Fresnel zone. And second, will UAV aided data relay improve the communication link quality? We attacked this problem via path loss. Because a decrease of the path loss directly indicates a better communication link. We will again look at a simple case, the free space propagation model, and then move on to the model we used, the NTIA extended HATA model, or eHATA model for short. Let's start with the direct line of sight model for finding blockages. As indicated by its name, it simply implies that if there is no obstacles between the transmitter and the receiver, then we will claim there is no blockage for the signal. For instance, in our illustration figure here, the user is blocked from the cell tower, because if we draw a line from the top of the cell tower to the user, there is a tree blocking that direct path. On the other hand, the UAV can see both the cell tower and the user directly, so there is no blockage for these two links. This is extremely intuitive and easy to implement in a simulator. However, the issue is that electromagnetic signals are waves that may experience phenomena like reflection and diffraction, which are completely ignored here. To get a more accurate result, we used another criterion which involves the idea for now zone. Surprise, surprise, named after the physicist for now. If we dig deep into the physics behind it, we will learn that the first Fresnel zone is the smallest three-dimensional region, an ellipsoid to be more specific, where a reflected signal may completely cancel out the transmitted signal, if there are obstacles in that region. Of course, real-life scenarios are way more complicated than this simplified one-flexion case, that's why the 60% clearance criterion we saw just now in Young's talk often works better in practice. Again, it simply says, in terms of the radius R, 60% of the region around the direct path should be clear of any obstacles. Otherwise, the signal will suffer so much interference caused by the environment that it's better to be considered as blocked. Even though the direct line of sight path may still be clear. Blockage is probably the most intuitive way to go when we talk about communication link status, but it is often too simplified, because we may still be able to get robust communication via a blocked link, or on the other side, we may not be able to communicate at all even with a clear path because the transmitter and the receiver are too far away from each other. So in our work, we also considered path loss as a complementary way of investigating the link condition. In fact, we all expect the power of the signal to decrease as it travels further and further away. The key insight for this slide is that we are all very wise to do so. If we assume the transmitter radiates the signal evenly to the direction of interest, then the area covered by a fixed angle will be larger and larger as the signal travels further and further away. Normally, the form factor of the receiver is fixed. For instance, if the receiver area is roughly A, as shown in this illustration figure, then the portion of energy it receives will be smaller and smaller. At a distance of R, it can receive all the rays shown here. But if we move to 2R, only around a quarter of the original energy will be received. That drops further to around one ninth after we move to the distance of 3R. Now, if we go back to the free space path loss formula used by Young's calculation, you can see the path loss is proportional to the distance squared. That comes after the fact that the surface area of a sphere is proportional to the radius squared. The other observation is that the path loss is also related to the signal wavelength, lambda. The shorter the wavelength, the bigger the free space path loss will be. By the way, that is one of the reasons why it is such a challenge to take advantage of shorter wavelength millimeter waves in 5G systems. 
again to get estimation results closer to real life cases. We used instead a more complicated model, the Yehada model, because it is one of the de facto models used by the regulatory agencies. And we chose the NTIA implementation to ensure we are looking at the problem from a regulator's point of view. It takes into consideration, besides distance and wavelength, the heights for the transmitter and the receiver, the terrain profile, that is, the changes in ground elevation between the transmitter and the receiver, as well as the environment type. For that, we used crop covered land in our simulations. Before we move on to the simulations, do we have any questions for this part? At last, we have carried out simulations for Indiana State, and some results are quite interesting. How large is the scale of the problems we are looking at here? Well, we started with the Purdue Research Farm, moved on to Tippecanoe County, where Purdue is located in, and then to including all the counties around it, known as the Wabash Heartland Innovation Network, or WAIN for short. At last, we carried out the analysis for the whole Indiana State. In terms of data size, the compressed raw LiDAR dataset alone is already 322 gigabytes. We also need the elevation information for locating the ground. The resulting data size for the Indiana State simulation is 939 gigabytes. To work with this amount of data, we took advantage of a cluster located at Purdue. We got a virtual machine with 36 cores. 216 gigabytes of RAM and over 2 terabytes of hard drive. In terms of computational power, it can achieve 285 giga floating point operations per second, or gigaflops for short. As a reference, the mobile workstation I have here for the recording, which is quite powerful, can only reach 50 gigaflops. The simulator we implemented is illustrated in this diagram. We have the core, a parallel computing pool to carry out the simulation, the preprocessors which prepare the data for the simulation, and postprocessors to analyze and visualize the results. The preprocessors, for example, the location sampler chooses the locations to inspect according to the area of interest. These are where the users will show up. The tower range manager determines which towers to consider. Then, together with the UAV heights to inspect, the workload scheduler distributes workload among the workers and oversees the simulation. It also generates recovery points for resuming the simulation in case of interruptions. We also have the geographic data preprocessor to index LiDAR and elevation data for faster data fetching. The core, based on specific models, calculates the blockage status and the path loss values, and generates accordingly the blockage maps and the path loss maps. Next, let's have a look at some illustration figures on how these key components work. First, these two figures illustrate which cellular towers were chosen by the tower range manager according to the area of interest, the typical county and the wing area respectively. In a word, the area of interest is extended by the maximum possible cellular coverage range, and all cell towers beyond that extended area will be ignored. The cellular tower locations were obtained from SysMac. They are real-life tower locations, but randomized a little bit to protect the proprietary information of the carriers. Then, these two figures illustrate which UAV locations were selected by the location sampler. Here we can see the sample number is decreased to compensate the increased area and thus the increased computation amount from one county to ten counties. Again, we used two channel models, the line of sight blockage model and the NTIA HADA model in the simulator to determine first the blockage status and second the path loss value for the drone location. For both cases, a 2D terrain profile approach has been adopted. Let's take the line of sight blockage case as an example here. For a given pair of cellular tower and UAV location to inspect, with a given UAV height, 
we will sample the LiDAR data along the direct path between the transmitter and the receiver and try to find any resultant samples in the 60% clearance zone. If any such sample is found, then that link is marked as blocked. The LiDAR data site we used was from the Indiana Statewide Imagery and LiDAR program. The resolution for it is 5 feet, which is around 1.5 meters. Next, let's look at some results for this. We will focus on the one area because it is big enough to be interesting, but not too big for clear visualizations. Here we have an animation to show the coverage growth for the line of sight blockage maps and the UAV height increases. If we compare these figures more closely, we can even tell which regions will benefit the most from UAV data relay. Note that just by flying the drones at 10 meters high, we would gain a dramatically bigger clear region compared to the typical pedestrian height case of 1.5 meters. This conclusion is easier to catch if we plot the line of sight coverage ratio over the drone height. As we can see, there is a huge boost by just increasing the drone to 10 meters. Beyond that, the coverage still increases, but not as dramatically. For the coverage map, we have path loss values obtained from the NTIA Ihada model, which indicate how much the signal would degenerate in the channel so the lower the value, the better. It is quite challenging to interpret these maps, because we would like the results to be independent of the equipment. To achieve that, we decided to look at the maximum allowed path loss values, and plotted accordingly the coverage ratio gain curves. For example, if we allow at most a path loss of 135 dB, then we can expect a coverage ratio of around 50% at a UAV height of 100 meters for typical new county and around 45% for the wing area. In a word, if you have the maximum transmitter power and the minimum detectable receiver power for your system, you can calculate the maximum allowed path loss accordingly and read out the coverage ratio gains from these curves. For LTE systems, if we use the typical cellular transmitter power of 100 watts, then roughly speaking, the path loss values we see here below 135 dB indicate a good connection, while this region corresponds to an acceptable connection condition. As we can see, by using UAV data relays, we would boost the good connection region the most for the typical county while the OK region benefits the most for the wing area. If we go back to the coverage maps, note that the values near 135 dB correspond to the orange area between red and yellow. We can see the area covered by red is shrinking, indicating better connection conditions as the UAVs fly higher. We have published these results in an IEEE paper, but after that, we were able to move on and carry out the simulation for the whole Indiana state, where we have observed similar results. We can see that for Indiana state, the most significant line of sight clearance boost can be obtained by increasing the relay OAV from 1.5 meters to 10 meters, and the data relay benefits the OK region the most. That's all. Again, our main contribution in this work is the upper bound for the system level coverage gain based on real life data for large geographic areas. Questions? Thank you very much. That's all for this presentation. We would also like to thank FAR and NSF for their sponsorship for this project. I hope you have enjoyed our presentation and please feel free to get in touch with us if you have more questions.